Hello, welcome back to Galata Studios. If it's your first time here, I'm David Galata. I'm the sole proprietor of Galata Studios. I'm an artist by trade. And here I am working on a painting that is from a series of paintings about mammoth caves. And this particular painting is actually in the true colors of the caves. I have some in the series that are emotional colors. I've been featuring some of those. And welcome to my YouTube page for Galata Studios. I also have a Facebook page where I do live feeds and that can be found at Facebook slash David Galata. And you can see me there Wednesdays where I do live feeds of my work. But for you guys here on YouTube, I'm recording this section here and Last time on a live feed, I worked on this backing area. Now I want to get to these rocks up here. This was a small formation. It's almost life size that was tucked away in a wall at Mammoth Caves in one of the upper chambers, although it still had some some water, probably because it had rained. Well, no, that's right. At the time it was it was it was January. So it was snow melt was coming down through the cave and dripping down into a small pool below. But before I get to any of the water here and the stones here, I have to get these background objects in first and I can work on everything else. So I've got a limited palette here of King's Blue, Payne's Gray, Cold Gray, Warm Gray, Old Holland Yellow Light, and an Olive Green Dark. These are all Old Holland colors. I do prefer them. I like to use the, the big tubes. Let me see if I can get that in there. There you go, Old Holland. I really love their paint and I love the way they make their paint. I've never had problems with their materials. And I have my little handy dandy jar of brushes. Yeah, it's an old olive jar, you know. That's a wonderful thing about having your own studio is that you have the opportunity to use the equipment you want and to reuse items. And why not? You know, I have some old vases I use for brushes, but I like to use jars as well. I use them for making mediums too. And that's always a handy thing to know. But today, I'm going to be focusing on this section of the Mammoth Cave and I'm going to use a soft filbert. This is a Performan Kolinsky from Germany. And a filbert brush is slightly rounded at the tip here. And this one is a sable brush. There's no medium I'm gonna be using here because every time you add a medium, unless it's wax medium, and then once you start with wax, you have to stay with wax. And I use wax very, very sparingly and very rarely. Instead, this is raw paint. So when it dries, it stays very dry looking, very matte like, very matte finish. And that's what I want because in general, the cave is dry. Now, there are gonna be some wet areas here that I'm going to have to glaze colors in with a small amount of medium to make them shine a bit. But I don't really wanna do that with the dry stone. And I may decide just to do reflections and things like that and not worry about what the glaze is. Although sometimes mediums can help protect the paint if they're used very sparingly, very, very sparingly. So what I wanna do is this stone here seems too similar to these rocks back here. Now they were similar, but this one's a bit too much so. So I wanna kinda of break that up a little bit. And one of the things I'm gonna do with that right away is introduce some darker colors here. And the first thing I'm gonna do is use some Payne's Gray. There we go, I'm just gonna mark off an area that shows where one formation ends and the next formation begins, just like that. Not too hard to do. In the meantime, I'm gonna use that same color here just to bring some shadows right into there, just like that, just dropping them in. Now I've got most of the paint now off of this brush, just a little bit remains. So I'm gonna come back in here and just lightly, just lightly scumble it in. Now I'm not blending paint, I'm not mixing them. This paint is very dry here. Uh, this painting has waited two weeks for the painting 
to dry thoroughly before attempting this because I don't want to blend the colors any further. I just want to lay in the proper colors over. And this is a nice shadowy color. And we're just going to get some of these shadows deeper in here as it goes down to the bottom. And then some of these shadows are going to come across here as well. And this area should be nice and shadowy. All right, I'm going to grab a little more of that paint. Same color. There we go. I really want to get that bottom in there done properly. There we go. There, that's better. Now, I'm going to take a round, and this is an Isabi Isocryl. I like Isabi. I like the Isocryl series. And here I'm going to go in with just a little bit of Olive Deep. There we go. Just a bit. I just want to get these shadows in, but I want to use a slightly different color. There we go. Just to bring in some of these shadows. There we go. Go back to the Payne's Gray. Just bring in the shadows. Just, just, to, just to flush them out a little bit. You know, I don't have to go crazy here. I do need to show some demarcation. There we go. All right. Get back into the Payne's Gray. Help this bit of olive along. And these, these formations were fascinating. They were fascinating to see. And if you ever get an opportunity to go to Mammoth Caves, which is in Kentucky, I really, really recommend it. And for those of you who have been here before, <laughs> you'll be like, ah, oh, there he goes again, talking about Mammoth Cave. Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm talking about Mammoth Cave again. I love that cave. Absolutely love that cave. Here we go. Now we've got a little, little better situated here. So I'm going to start off with darks. It's always a good idea to start off getting your darks in there, getting your shadows, so you have a better idea as to what's going on in the painting. And sometimes it is not terribly obvious. Sometimes the stone... There we go, just, just a bit, just a bit in there. I don't want too much. Really easy to overdo it. Very easy to overdo lights, very easy to overdo dark. So you get caught up. It's really what it is. You get, you get caught up. You just, oh, you just want to keep going, keep going. You don't want it to end. You're just having so much, so much joy from bringing these shadows in and bringing this piece of stone to life that everything else seems to fade off as being inconsequential. And this is not true. We do have to be cautious. We do have to really think and plan what we're doing so it makes sense to the human eye. And we lose sight of that. As artists, we will fail. I don't care if it's an abstract or if it's a realist painting or hyper-realist. You've got to keep in mind your audience. And your audience is humanity. That's your audience. It really is. That's your when you're painting. That's your audience. That's your audience. Humanity. So you want things that have meaning for humanity. I think sometimes the art world forgets about that. You know, they get very, very caught up in things. Now I'm putting in some more of this greenish color, just barely. I'm going to finger paint again. If you know me at all, if you've been to any of my live feeds or if you've watched any of these videos before, you'll know I, I am infamous for my finger painting. And yes, my hands are clean. You know, I don't want to get too much junk on my my poor, poor canvas here. I don't want oils in the skin to break up the paint and cause problems later on. Even if I'm not going to be there, but especially because I'm not going to be there. I'm not going to be there to help fix it, am I? Oh, I'm going to be long gone. So the idea is to make sure that things are looking good and that 
things are safe while you're around because they're not going to be able to consult you later on. You know, 200 years from now, who's going to know me? Yeah, so now I'm relying on conservators and whatnot to fix my work. Uh, I don't like that idea at all. Not because I don't like conservators, don't get me wrong. I think they do a marvelous job. And I'm very grateful that, that they do the job that they do. I mean, the art world would be in real trouble without those guys. Real trouble. It would be bad. It would be bad. But I know many of them complain that they really have to guess sometimes as to what methods an artist used in order to create their painting, because that can really help them out in repairing a painting. So if this painting ever needs repair, yeah, with these videos, you'll have a better idea as to how I painted it. I'm just gonna wipe off my fingers here on my little rag. All right, so I've got my two dark colors on these, these guys, so now I'm gonna get some light colors. And for that, I'm gonna use a small Isabi Filbert. This is a little guy. Yeah, just, just this, this little guy is a lot, of, a lot of fun to work with. And I'm gonna start off with a bit of this cool gray and reestablish some of the gray's dominance here. Just to bring it in a little bit more, a little bit further. This looks like it was a piece of stalactite that had fallen from the ceiling. Sometimes they do it, they'll snap and just right off, just like that. I'm not sure what sound they make, but I like to make up a little sound for them. I think they should make like a little popping sound. I'm sure it makes quite a noise when it when it falls. Yeah. And things do that. It's rare. It's very rare. I mean, you, you can walk in a cave for decades and never witness anything like that. You know, it's not like they just come falling out of the sky or anything. Now I'm going to go right into the warm gray. And one of the things that I'm doing here is I'm not washing off the brush between colors. Why is that? I want to break up all my colors. I want to make sure that they, they're rough, like the stone is rough. The stone has lots of different colors. It's not just gray. It's blue grays and green grays and brown grays. And I want to give a sense of that as well. So here I've got this lighter color, which has like a warmer touch to it. I like that warmer touch. And I've got footnotes from when I was down in the cave. And these footnotes help me to know where to place my brush strokes and in what direction. When I was down in the caves some years ago, I couldn't finish the paintings there. It'd take too long, especially with the style that I wanted to use. If I wanted to use a very uh, impressionist immediate moment kind of style then sure I could have finished that right there and in fact some of the people there thought it, that they were already finished and I was like no 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 I gotta take these back to the studio and finish them up properly really give them a, a nice finishing there we go oh that's nice I like that and it certainly stands out more from the background now, which I'm really happy about. So let's go into a bit of the King's Blue now. Again, I'm not cleaning off the brush. I want this blue to be kind of busted up a little bit by the other colors. And I'm just gonna place it here and there. I don't wanna place it all over because that will take away from the variety of colors that can be found in just a plain piece of stone. Check it out sometime, you know, go outside. You know, it's fun outside. You can have a good time there. And you can pick up a rock. Really look at the colors. Really take a look. It's not just brown or gray. Lots of other colors are living in there too. You just gotta take a moment to really look, really see, and then you'll find them. You'll find all the colors in the rainbow and stones and more. You know, especially if you collect stones. I, I like to. I enjoy collecting stones. Something I got from my grandfather. He collected stones. He was a rock hound. 
he also used to go to the shows and things like that. And there were a few times he took me along. I found it fascinating. I, I love that kind of stuff. And uh, been rock hounding a few times. Dug up uh, fossils and, and jasper and things like that. Garnet. You know, just little places, you know, not strip mining. You know. Used to be more of a popular hobby way back when. It has waned, which is a shame because people have forgotten. They've forgotten stone. They've lost track of it all. There. That's much, much better. I like that. We're going to keep that for now. Might go in later on for more details, but for now, I like the way that's coming along. All right, so let's go back to our wide brush here. We're going to work on this next stone. We always go from the back most to the front most, because if you're going the other way, oh, it's twice the work. It really, it really is. It's, it's twice the work. It's, it's awful. All right, let's see what my footnotes are saying here. Well, first they're saying that it's really dark here. And I've got these little ridges here just coming down. And this, this whole little area was a little tumble down. Everything had fallen. See, in this way, when I put the water in, the stone is already in place. So I can just actually paint the water right over the rock. Right there. Easy as can be. You know, I think sometimes half of painting is trying to figure out what would be the easiest way of showing this. Because it's already hard enough. You know, it's not easy doing this sort of work. And it's something I always try to instill in my students is you, you will work, you will work, you will... You will learn, you will grow, you will work, and you'll have a greater appreciation. And when you go to a museum, you'll sit there and like, what did these knuckleheads have to do to get these effects, to express these emotions, to get these colors to work well together? I mean, good heavens. You know, it just seems amazing what people can do with just a few colors. And it takes practice. It's the practice of art. One does not become a master artist. One is hailed as a master artist. There is the difference. One is acknowledged as one. You don't sit there and say, well, I'm the best thing since sliced bread. I mean, you can, some people do. You know, it works for some folks, but Tell you the truth, there are going to be plenty of people who aren't going to believe you. Not until the test of time is done. And you never know, you could be very popular in your own time. Make lots of money, have lots of clients, and then when you're gone, your work is forgotten. That happens a lot in art. It, it, it's almost disturbing how often that, that occurs. And that to me just speaks of how out of touch many of the arts critics are today because most of them are looking backwards you know what I say most there's always a few who are trying to look forward who are trying to see where the artists are actually going today and what they're doing they may or may not agree, but, you know, they should try to be accurate about it. Right now, there seems to be almost a, a media war about it. You know, what's, what's real work and what's not, what's valid. You know, just, you know, they're so concerned that the galleries are suffering. And, well, maybe the galleries are suffering because they charge such such high commissions. Maybe, maybe they're suffering because they've been promoting work that most people, except for the, a wealthy few, they don't want. 
in their living room. You know, they don't want to have this thing sitting there in their home. People are making art to find themselves in a museum. No, that's done later. If your work stands the test of time, then sure, sure, I can, I can see that. I can see where that, you know, where that happens. But to design work, to say, hey, look at me, I, I, I want to be in a museum. To me, that doesn't really serve humanity. It serves yourself. And there's been a lot of that. There's been a lot of that in art. There's been a lot of that in many other fields as well. It's not just the arts that are suffering from this, this ultra hubris that we're seeing today. You know, now I don't include politics. You won't hear me talk about politics. I, I, I'm tired of politics. I have been for a very, very long time, decades. Uh, I am much more interested in this and doing a good job with this. Nothing else really interests me that much. There we go. Yeah, except a few things. I love astronomy. All right, I'm gonna go back into these grays now. And I just want to reestablish some grays. And again, we, we talk about reestablishing them. I guess I should say something about what I mean by that. Is sometimes when you're when you're doing this, you blur the line, and sometimes that can happen a little too much. And you lose the base color of everything. And I want the base color to be this varied gray, because that was the color that I remember there. That's what all my footnotes here talked about. And I use brush strokes for my footnotes. You know, I didn't, didn't write things down in a notebook. I know I probably could have. It might have been easier. But it wouldn't have helped me as much in the studio, I'll tell you that. This is much, much better. You know, here I know exactly what it is that I need to do because I've got those brush strokes there. So, just gonna wipe off the brush a little bit and go back into the warm gray. And here we go around and around and around the palette. Go from one, one color to the next. You wanna bring up some of these brown. Some, some brown. There we go. Yeah, that really separates it nicely from its, from its brethren there. And I wanna do that. I wanna bring this stone in. It's really interesting to me how often stone formations also look like things like wood. You know, especially that they get become layered and layered and you swear it's like wood grain. You know, is that a gray log or is, is that a piece of stone? Yeah, it's a piece of stone. There we go. I get some of that in there. Kind of blocky. Yeah. Get that in nice and smooth. All right, good. Now we're going to go into the king's blue, but not so much. Not so much. I just want to put in strips of it here and there. Or maybe the light catches a little bluish tendency in the stone. Maybe there's some slate underneath it. So you want to bring that out just a bit, just a bit. All right. Now I'm going to get into that old Holland yellow light, which looks like white. It's an off-white. It's almost like an eggshell white. It's a beautiful color. It does a very nice job with soft highlights. It seems to work well with others when it comes to what it does with the paint. There we go. I'll bring that out just a little bit. I'll bring this one forward too. Right up to there. Right up to the edge. And I'm just going to blend the bottom edge. But this way it looks like water striking the stone maybe or highlights from it. This one sticks out a little too much and gets splashed. Bring this one into the club. Why not? There. 
just just using the edge of the brush here that's what I'm using just the edge of the brush yeah. there we are now we like that I'm gonna do the same thing here use the edge of the brush I was working on a mammoth cave piece earlier well, the one behind me here that was my live feed for today I've done that for YouTube but today I decided to give the folks at Facebook a little gander at that one while I'm working on it. There we go. Just a little bit. Sometimes it's just a slow buildup of color. Just a bit at a time. There. Alright. Now i got to get this top here. I'm just going to bring it down. And again, I'm going to dip it into the paint. And the paint is very thick. It's like butter, but it's like cold butter. It's very firm paint, which is good. That's exactly what I want. You know, when I was in college, they, they talked about how you wanted everything soft. I, I vehemently disagree. Um, and as I recall, I disagreed at the time. But that's what they wanted. I, I didn't think that that was proper. And later on I found out that, yeah, that was not really proper. But it is what the professor at the time did. So they were teaching their method. Yeah. Now today I get to teach mine. Now I'm just fanning out that brush just a little bit as you saw, just to get some textures in there. Broken off rough, rough bits. You know, like I said I don't want this too smooth. If it's too smooth, it's not gonna look right. But if it's too rough, it's also going to look like just a bunch of paint spatters it's not going to look like stone. I'm going to wipe off the brush because I really want to keep my brush free of paint at the ferrule which is the metal part. Once you get paint in there it's really hard to get it out. You can wash, you can wash, you can wash and guess what? It's not happening. It's not going to come out. And then you might be painting later on with a nice delicate color and all of a sudden some green pops out from the ferrule. Not good. Now you gotta scrape it all off and start again or wait for it to dry and paint over it. I don't know which one's worse. Okay, I've got a small rock here that is behind this rock. So I gotta bring that one out and then this one. So we're gonna go back to the Payne's Gray. And you see how this works going back and forth and back and forth like this. And I can see I've got some, some shadows here. It's going to go up right into here. Just like that. And this was a smoother piece of stone, which I can see from my, my little footnotes. Footnotes in the dark. There we are. I'm just going to bring in some of that color. All right, now I'm going to go right into that olive color. And bring that in. Here I want it coming around the bend here. But this stone is very, very gray. doesn't have a lot of features, so I'm just going to bring in some influences from this green here and there. There we go. Now we've got some green influences in there. All right. Now, last time I used the thinner round brush, but with this stone, that's not going to work so well. So we're actually going to go back to this filbert and grab our cold gray. I'm going to bring that in from right there. Follow 
follow the contours. It's important. If you don't follow those contours, your work's going to look like it's flying apart. Rather than being coherent, it's going to look like random brush strokes. We don't want that. We've worked too hard, too hard, to do that to ourselves. There we go. Some of those greens are showing up, though. Very subtle. Very subtle. Like in the stones. Very subtle effect. You don't want to go crazy. Going crazy doesn't help. Go too far. Especially with something realist. And this takes its time. This is slow going. And it should be. It should be slow going. Every time people are in a rush, it just doesn't seem to work out well. Alright, I've almost completely covered over my original footnote. Which is good, because now it's beginning to look more like actual stone. And not like a random bunch of brush strokes. I'm going to bring that warm gray in, and I'm going to focus the warm gray towards the top. I'm bring that in. Bring one top. I'm just going to blend it down. There we go. Bring it over. Yeah, there's the top of the stone. I'll wipe off the brush just a little bit. Grab a little bit more paint. And just bring this right over that. And let it fall. There we go. So I'm always trying to keep my brush strokes even here. There. You know, I don't want a lot of random stuff here. Because this is a much softer piece of stone. Perhaps this was a chunk of limestone that had fallen and started dissolving under the water dripping. Happens. Happens in the cave. You know, a chunk of limestone. Half a million years later, it's gone. <laughs> so enjoy it now. <laughs> it's still there. I just want to get that feel for, for that. All right. I'm not going to use the blue. I am going to go right into my light color here and just bring in a little bit more light. I'm going to wipe off my brush again. I want to get it nice and clean. Here we go. Over the top. And down we go. There, yeah, going for this side. Down we go. Right down to the water's edge. I'm going to tap this in. I want to establish a presence of rock here. There we go. Nice and bumpled. We've got lots of bumps, which is good. We want that. And now I'm going to come in and just give it a little, a little texture by tapping the brush into the wet paint. There we go. Give it that. Bring that in. Smooth that down. And again, we bring that in. We smooth it down. I'm going to come back in here. Smooth it down. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. Just concentrating. Oh, my goodness. There's a lot to concentrate on with this piece. A lot of things happening here, a lot of textures, a lot of, a lot of planes that need to be established. 
There, now I've got my little rocks in the front. Okay, so now I have to work on this piece here. And I have time to do that, which is great. I was concerned. Here we go. I have wiped off my brush. I'm going to go back into the Payne's Gray. And I want to get this bit done. So I'm going to go right into there. Right down to the very bottom of the stone. All these cracks, all these fissures in the rock need to be defined. There we go. Get in here. Do some more. You don't want to get rid of all your darks. You also don't want to not leave room for, for light colors. You're going to need those. You're going to need them all. There we go. Bring that up. And a big old split in the rock. And then we have this side passage here. Now what you won't see in the camera is on the side passage here, there was a little bit of crinkling to the paint. And that was because this paint, when I was using it, was very, very thin. It had been thinned very heavily to make it very fluid for a fast sketch. Because I knew I'd be bringing it back here to finish off. So I didn't want to have to worry about it drying on the way home. It would be dry long before we left. And that worked out very well, but that also meant that when it dried, the paint cracked a little. But now I'm putting heavy raw paint right on there. And that's going to help stabilize this whole area. Get some more of these greenish colors in here. You notice I'm just pasting those here and there. And that's because this is going to blend with other colors. So I'm actually mixing the paint right on the canvas here. And that's a, a method of alla prima, even though this is not being done alla prima. But now I've got some interesting colors there. And again, this is a very large area, so I'm going to go right into some of this blue here. Reestablish some of that. Have it meet some of this greenish area. And this way too, it looks like a, a different kind of stone than what's behind it. This way everyone knows, ah, oh, it's a different rock. I am very tempted I think I mentioned this once before. I'm, I'm very, very tempted to do a more fantastical painting based on this formation. But I want to get this one done first. Now here I'm taking that same blue. In fact, I haven't even cleaned off the brush. All I'm doing is taking the used brush and going up and down. And you get some really interesting shadows that way. There we go. Really nice shadows deep in there. They're showing that there's other stuff going on that you can barely see. Always adds interest. Now we're going to bring in some grays. And these grays are dark. They're darkish grays. That's all right. And you go right down to the water's edge. These gray areas mixing in with some of that green. right into the shadows and emerge up from the shadows right down to the water's edge establish a little more gray there but now the gray is a slightly different color from many of the other rocks and yet it still looks related excuse me shirts trying to choke me here you that or my beard's trying to tuck in Hard to tell sometimes which one's the guilty party. 
I'm sure my beard is sitting there saying, no, it was him. He did it. He forced me. I'm sure Mr. Shirt is not amused. All right, let's get this gray in. There we go. There, that's good. Yeah, bring that in nicely. There. Yeah. I like that. All right, warm gray. Back to the warm, doing my cycle. Just jumping around, doing the cycle here. Just a bit of that warm gray in here. And a touch of it over here. There we go. A little bit coming down from above. Smooths everything. And it gives its own tones. Kind of dirties it a little bit, which is what I want. This is stone. There we go. Good. This is not a flower garden. This is a stone garden in many ways. I'm going to bring in that highlight. And I'm going to come in again. Very light touch. There. And again. From the side. Almost like I'm drawing hands. Very much has that same feel to it. There we go. Bring in these shapes. And I hope that you enjoy these videos. I like doing them. I like sharing. I like sharing what I do. It's one of the reasons I'm doing this. Just because I like to share. live in a very populated area so sometimes it's hard to find students and the like so it's nice to be able to share what I do here there we go if you want to learn more about the studio and what I do you can always hop on over to my Facebook page Art by David Galata, Galata Studios, or to David Galata slash Facebook. And you can also take a look at my Patreon page. I have a Patreon page, uh, Patreon slash Galata Studios. There I am. If you want to learn more, you want to find out more about what I'm doing and why, it's all there. And there's a lot of really good things that you can get becoming a patron if you want. That's what you want to do. No pressure. No pressure. I don't want to pressure people. People have enough pressures in their lives. They don't need more coming from me. There we go. But I do believe that anyone who enjoys artwork and enjoys the arts will enjoy those pages. And if you have any suggestions or any things that you would like to say, please feel free to comment or email. I'm also found at galatastudios.com. Uh, it's my web page. And it's a neat little place. You get to see all my older works. Um, I'm going to be updating it soon with some, some newer work. Just tapping in some details here while I talk. And that's a good place to get to know what's going on around here and what I'm what I'm doing and to see just to see there's links to all my other pages and that way if you really want to get involved with the studio you can you're invited also please feel free to share these videos uh, and if you check out the live feeds, please feel free to share those as well. 
That's how we artists get the word out. Word of mouth beats anything else. It really does. It really, really does. I relied on galleries for some time and while that was okay it was not really what I was looking for I was looking for finding people who were interested in art and not in art as an investment you know what I mean I didn't care for that point of view I didn't like the way that you know the arts were just being treated as a way of making even more money as opposed to what are we expressing? How are we doing that? What methods are we using? And it was some that were interesting. Uh, there was one gallery that was uh, starting up some years ago from a former uh, gallery owner who I had worked with and she wanted to do like poetry readings and all of that and I was like, that's very interesting but you know, I'd rather just make the work, you know, <laughs> you, know? you know, she wanted the artist to talk about their work and all of that, talk about what they were doing and why. And, you know, I thought that was interesting enough, but I just realized it was going to take time away from what I was doing. And then, uh, it just seemed like... A rarity for anyone to really get into just just doing just being everyone was in a, a rush to get rich yeah and you know, I'm very fortunate I have a clientele I do have support at home for doing this I do have students help keep the studio alive. And not everyone has that. I'd like to introduce other artists and, you know, work with people. Um, some of my students have gone on to become artists. In fact, one is, is doing some local teaching. arts projects and things like that teaching people how to how to paint you know beginning kind of stuff and I think that's great that's really fantastic because I think that's needed people really miss out on quite a bit when they feel that well only a great master can make a painting no no no, no. not true not true. Many people who were never considered masters are considered great masters now. They like you to think that they know what's going to happen historically. They don't. They don't. They don't. I just won't participate in that kind of lie. We don't know. We have no idea what's going to happen. 200 years from now, 100 years from now, we, 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 don't, we don't know. And art history runs along those lines. It runs on, on ancient works all the way up to the most modern stuff. So I'm not very into living artists being in museums. I think there's enough of that. And we don't know. We may change our minds very, very quickly. You know, we can be very fickle as an audience, the human race. We can just decide, ah, we actually didn't like this guy's work. You know, now you got to take them down from the museum. Now you've invested all that in something that didn't speak beyond the modern time. And that also happens. So don't chase the museums. Chase how your work affects people. Now I hear from people. People have been very kind. And I thank everyone who has sent me a comment or an email, either through YouTube or Facebook. Thank you. Thank you so much. Because that really does help 
I want to hear from people. Now, I'm not going to lock myself up in a little ivory tower and just assume that everything I'm doing is golden. That would be foolish. And I really don't want to be foolish. Well, at least I try not to be. <laughs> Hard to tell sometimes. All right, I'm going to get back into da -da -da, our highlight color again. I'm going to start from the top. Bring this one in. And this one's got more of a highlight because it's much closer to the front, much closer to the viewer, who at the time was me. There we go. I'm just going to bring that in. Bring in this top here. There, we've got all of our colors all together now. bring in some details and this is not the last layer for this piece far from it there will be more this is just redefining everything and then we're going to come in and we're going to do more and one of the things I'm hoping to do is to do the entirety of my mammoth series live or filmed for YouTube that people can see how it happened. And that way I'm sharing with everyone my obsession with rocks. Here we go. Got this big rock sitting there. Now what I want to do is I want to take a little scrubby brush here. And I just want to reestablish this area here. There we go. I'm not really doing much here. I'm just trying to get this line back into place because this was the shape of the rock that is in front of everything. And this is why we do the background stuff first. And then we go, because now we'll be able to paint over that. Now I've got this little bit here and this little bit here and then I'm done for the day. That's nice. So we're going to go back to our dark colors and here it's just going to be a little bit. I've got a little shelf like thing here. A little, little bit right there. And on this side I don't really have a lot of dark here. So I'm just going to put a little bit here and just a little bit there. Just a touch. I'm going to do the same thing with the olive greens which have been so effective today. I really have enjoyed working with the olive greens. In fact, I'm going to put some more right in there. I'll have to refix that up. Hang on a sec. I'm going to mix the two. I'm just going to come in there. And just, yeah, bring in some details of the rock. Good. Now I'm going to bring that in. There we go. Back to where you belong. All right. So bring in some of the olives, uh, olivey colors here. All right, we're gonna go back into the blue. Very important color in this. Just like that. Just to indicate that there have been some other pieces of fallen stone got caught up in this, this tumble down. Maybe once one stalactite went, it took all the others around it with it, brought them all crashing down. Okay. I'm not going to make that too shadowy, but I want to add a little extra shadow color there. That'll do. All right, now, warm gray. Once again, we've got our warm gray. And we're gonna bring that in, just. There we go. Bring that in. Little bits, little flakes of stone. Right there, it's these little bits of stone. And right here. 
little bits of stone and right down to the edge of the waters. There we go. All right. Now for this one, I want to bring in a little more of that green. Yeah, that's better. And now back to the white. And here I'm going to bring it out here. Just going to bring in just some rough textures going, just wiggling my brush back and forth, just, just to get some textures in there. And then here, I'm going to come down a little more smoothly, maybe indicate a different kind of stone. And most of the stone, there was limestone and sandstone. There's gypsum. I think there's some shale there. Among others. There we go. Now we've got our little rocks in place. We established the edge of our viewing area. Bring that down into place. Good. I'm going to take this brush here. Just going to neaten this up just. Just a bit, just a bit. And sometimes it's hard to tell when to stop. And I often hear that from a lot of my students. I don't know when to stop. I'm like, welcome to the club. I don't either half the time. <laughs> and I don't. There we go. Oh, that's much nicer. All right, so there we have it. We have this central area in and then we get to work on everything else above here because there's a whole area straight up above that needs to be done. And now let's see if I can zoom this in so you can actually see this is what we worked on today. There we go. That's what we worked on today. Okay. Eh? Very nice. Now let me bring this back out. I hope you have enjoyed this session here at Galata Studios. I know I have enjoyed doing it. And I hope that you will join me in the future. Uh, there will not be a YouTube video for next week, uh, but there will be one for the week after. So hope to see you all in a couple of weeks. And I'll be back painting more things for you to enjoy. So, happy painting. Hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.